Hi everyone. Welcome back to the second day of this online international conference on theological genealogies of modernity. Today we'll continue our exploration of this rich topic as is evident from our discussion yesterday. But before we begin, I would like to flag up a couple of practical points um, for those of us, uh, for those who are joining us today. Um, let me briefly explain how the conference sessions work. Each session you will be begin with the main speaker summarizing his or, her, his or her paper, followed by a brief response from a respondent. Then we'll enter in a time of discussion, first amongst the panelists. And in the final 15 minutes or so, I will then take questions from the floor. Um, let me encourage you to send questions using the Q&A box in, the, uh, in Zoom during the sessions. Now, I also want to clarify that the conference papers have not been circulated amongst the participants. So we don't assume that you have read all the papers, but our speakers will summarize their papers and our respondents have access to the full papers. Um, this is just to clarify a point that's been raised by some of you uh, yesterday. If you're interested, um, we're planning to publish the full papers from this conference as a special issue in the journal Modern Theology. Now with housekeeping out of the way, um, let me introduce our first speaker today. Peter Harrison is a professorial research fellow and director of the Institute of, for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland, Australia. He works in the area of intellectual history with a focus on philosophical, scientific and religious thought of the early modern period. Uh, he has a particular interest in historical and contemporary relations between science and religion. His recent book, The Territories of Science and Religion, published in 2015, offers a groundbreaking genealogy of the modern categories, science and religion. His paper today is entitled Normativity and the Critical Functions of Genealogy, the Case of Modern Science. So I hand the floor to you, Peter, to hear your thoughts on uh, genealogy from a working historian's perspective. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks again to the organisers for this, um, this, this terrific meeting uh, with a great lineup of speakers. Um, hello to all of those out there who I can't see, but I believe are tuning in from, from uh, a, a number of different um, destinations. Okay, so look, um, this paper deals with one of the general questions posed by the conference organisers to do with the relation between the descriptive and normative um, aspects of the theological genealogies. So while some have sought to distinguish between three types of genealogy, problematizing, subversive, and vindicatory, my suggestion is that we think of all genealogies as, as problematizing, or, or critical would be my word, and they're critical at two possible levels. More explicitly normative layers might then be added to this critical foundation. So we get something like this. Um, so I, I'm questioning that standard threefold typology. Further, I think that all genuine genealogies are to a degree subversive and, and, and a number of the so-called vindicatory genealogies are in fact nothing but Whig histories. Now at a basic level, genealog genealogical approaches reveal that our present concepts, values and institutions result from historical processes that might have yielded different outcomes simply by drawing attention to the contingent nature of our present ways of thinking by means of a careful excavation of the historical circumstances that gave rise to them, uh, genealogies thus open them up for critical scrutiny. They help us think critically about certain foundational assumptions that we simply take for granted or assume are natural and universal rather than culturally specific and conditioned. Now, there's nothing normative per se about this. There's also a second more robust level of critique that takes a step beyond these general problematizing moves, but again I think without necessarily moving to normativity or normative judgments. This level involves the posing of what, for want of a better expression, I'll call the logical question. Now in the case of theological genealogies, this takes the form of inquiring whether the rationale of modern institutions of morality, politics, the sciences or whatever 
is, can be sustained when considered in purely secular terms. Whether, in other words, the real justificatory foundations lie in concealed and inescapable theological commitments. And the paradigm case, I think, for this is Nietzsche on, on morals. So here he says, when one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to Christian morality from under one's feet. Nietzsche goes on to point out uh, that the norms that, that norms that have the same content as Christian morality are, quote, by no means self-evident, and their true over, that their true origins have been forgotten. In line with Nietzsche's principle, a genealogical tracing of the secularization of Christian morality may thus expose a hidden logical dependence uh, on uh, a hidden logical dependence of our present moral standards um, that's masked by a kind of historical amnesia and the assumption that these moral principles are actually just natural or self-evident or that their Christian foundations can simply be swapped out with something like utilitarianism, which is the main target of Nietzsche's critique here. More generally, I think genealogical approaches have the capacity to highlight some of the conceptual confusions that inhabit modern forms of thought, which in their most acute manifestations give rise to self-contradiction. Now, the Nietzsche example is instructive, I think, for another reason. The ultimate goal of genealogy of morals, or indeed Twilight of the Idols, needless to say, perhaps, is not to endorse Christian moral principles. But Nietzsche's intention is at least in principle separable from the details of his genealogy. This suggests that theological genealogy in the very broad sense of a gene genealogy that recognises the historical significance of theological considerations in the formation of modern institutions need not rest on any normative theological commitments or call for recommendations in line with those commitments. It's important then to distinguish this level of what I've called logical critique from subsequent normative recommendations that might follow. The latter come after the historical work, which can presumably be assessed on generally accepted canons of historical evidence, although this is not entirely straightforward either. Now, a number of the classic genealogies of the 20th century exhibit elements of this logical critique. So writing in the 1920s, Carl Schmitt famously proposed that, I quote, all significant concepts of the theory of the state are secularised theological concepts. The implication here is that modernity had plagiarised a set of fundamentally Christian concepts while carrying on as if these were its own creations. Enlightened liberalism on Schmidt's analysis simply cannot work because in order to function, societies actually need a voluntary sovereign authority, although this is antithetic to avowed liberal principles. We encounter another version in Karl Lovett's Meaning and History. Lovett famously argued that the modern idea of human progress by means of science and technology was a secularized version of Christian eschatology. Purportedly novel enlightenment aspirations were simply distorted versions of Christian conceptions in disguise. Moreover, not only were enlightenment conceptions of human progress borrowed from a heretical version of Christian eschatology, neither did they serve any liberating function, instead actually restricting the possibilities for human flourishing. Thus, what to enlightenment apologists looked like progress was in fact decline. Now, what these examples show is that theological genealogies, broadly conceived, can perform quite robust critical functions at two distinct levels before normative issues enter the picture. The measure of this is the degree to which the same basic genealogy or the same basic historical work can support contrasting normative prescriptions. So Lovett would not agree with Schmidt's um, prescriptions, on the contrary, but nonetheless there is a similar form to the historical genealogy. Now before turning to some recent examples of genealogy, it's worth mentioning at least one powerful objection to the Lovitz style uh, genealogy. In his magisterial legitimacy of the modern age, Hans Blumenberg denied that modernity had concealed what were essentially theological concepts beneath a thin veneer of secularity. Briefly, against the idea that the modern world was illicitly dependent on the rationale of antecedent theological ideas, Blumenberg contended that modern, modernity was legitimate in its own right. Its central ideas were not illicit continuations of past notions in disguise, but reoccupations, to use his, his term, of vacated spaces. There may have been some continuity of questions 
but for Blumenberg, the inadequacy of, the, of medieval Christianity's answers to its own questions, now translated into the modern world, made this space available for novel solutions that involved a new human confidence and self-assertion. Now, this is not the occasion for a full assessment of Blumenberg's detailed argument, but briefly, we might wonder whether Blumenberg was too reliant on the idea, on the idea of an epoch, epochal shift that he encountered in Lervet. This committed him to a notion of modernity that taken as a whole is understood to have its, its own legitimacy or not. But it might be that some aspects of modernity rest on intelligible premises, but others do not. Perhaps it's not a matter of asking whether the modern age is legitimate or illegitimate in toto, but of asking which of its features might have an unacknowledged genetic connection to a theological principle and remain logically dependent upon it. This can be assessed independently, I think, of commitments to contestable normative principles. Now, let me say parenthetically, this whole package issue, whether modernity is a complete package, is not unrelated to the, the question I put to, to, um, to Brad yesterday about the prospects of perhaps retaining the good bits of modernity and, and discarding the bad bits. So uh, it's a question of whether you can mix and match or, or whether some critique of modernity means that you, you have to dispense with the whole thing. Now, in the, in the written paper, I consider a number of test cases from the history of science. And, and what these suggest is that at least some modern conceptions, the modern idea of laws of nature, for example, um, in which is an example in which virtually all of the substantive content of the original theological con conception flows into modern discourse, but without the theological rationale that would render it fully intelligible. That is to say, that the novel conception of laws of nature that originates with Descartes and was filled out by Newton and others, which has a voluntarist deity arbitrarily instituting laws, the immutability and universality of which rest upon aspects of the divine nature, the logic of, these, the logic of laws as we presently understand them still depends on this theological conception. Now this case parallels Nietzsche's point about the foundations of mod modern, sorry, this case parallels Nietzsche's point about the foundations of moral imperatives, since it, since it doesn't require any commitment one way or the other to the original theological grounding. The point is simply that there's a logical dependence. So for example, the contemporary philosopher of science, Nancy Cartwright, is able to draw upon this theological geneal geneal genealogical dependence to suggest that we should abandon this classical conception of laws of nature, because if there is no God, there are no laws. Now, a second test case for the Blumenberg narrative concerns the values that modern science, or more correctly, experimental natural philosophy, needed to draw upon to establish its, to establish its social legitimacy uh, when it was getting off the ground in the 17th century. Here again, there is a straightforward story that those values came from Christian theology through a new physico-theological amalgam through a particular reading of the four narratives that gave the new sciences a redemptive function and by proposing that the practical benefits of science should be understood as the practice of Christian charity. Now, arguably in this instance, however, the theological conceptions were themselves subject to a significant mutation, giving rise to a new conception of natural philosophy, sorry, natural theology and a Faustian partnership with what would become a utilitarian approach to the natural world. And so rather than a one-way logical dependence, we have something more like the beginning of a heterodox secularised Christianity. And this looks more like a parallel to John Milbank's argument to the effect that the social sciences, the modern social sciences, are heretical deviations from Christianity. An assessment that these are heretical does indeed involve a normative judgment. And this brings me then to the last part of the paper that concerns the, normative, the normativity question um, and more recent genealogical treatments. Now, John Milbank's theology and social theory certainly operates at the level of logical critique, pointing out, for example, that the ways in which Scottish political economy in the 18th century invoked divine providence to harmonise private vices with social good, an invocation now silently elided in the modern social sciences. Here, as in the case of modern laws of nature, we have a divine agency being more directly pressed into service as an explanatory device um, 
than we see in the Middle Ages. Modern sociology then needs to conceal, and I'm quoting here, its own theological borrowings and its own quasi-religious status, much as Walter Benjamin had argued that Marxism uh, needed to conceal its secret theological and mess messianic animus. On the normative side, however, because John Wright was a theologian explicitly seeking to provide, and I quote, a Catholic Christian account of reality, normative assertions are an expectation. So John gets a free pass on this normativity. It's different for historians. Brad Gregory's unintended refer reformation, for example, mostly exemplifies what I've called logical critique and does much more besides. But on the critique side, Brad has proposed that modern liberalism, for example, implicitly relies on moral and anthropological assumptions that are unsupported by the sciences. Uh, similarly, modernity's conception of reason is said to be too feeble to provide the metaphysical foundations for the kinds of norms required for the flourishing of democracies. But because Brad's argument is accompanied, was accompanied by normative judgments, and I know Brad will contest this, but the logical force of his more neutral or logical claims was often overshadowed. My sense is that the vehemence of some of the reactions to his work simply evidences the equal and opposite normative biases of his critics. What were ostensibly methodological objections often turn out to be just disguised statements of an alternative normative commitment. The overall outcome was that the logical critique aspect of Brad's work was overshadowed by more heated ideological posturing and historically and philosophically tractable questions became conflated with irreconcilable normative differences. The hostile and heated response generated by some of the mild proposals set out in Thomas Nagel's Mind and Cosmos serves as another instance of this tactic of playing the ball and not the person. And this brings me then to the a final complication that I'll finish with. And that is that what counts as neutrality or normativity is is in fact typically part of what's at stake in comprehensive genealogies in which the epistemological, political and normative foundations of modernity alike are in fact the objects of logical critique. So under critical pressure in the epistemological case is an insistence that instrumental reason combined with some form of naturalism is the only proper starting point for an inquiry. In the political sphere, it's the assumption that liberalism is neutral with respect to moral and religious questions. In the ethical sphere, it is that certain moral imperatives can be grounded independently of teleological or theological considerations. Now, because these criticisms often emerge as part of the same comprehensive genealogy, it might be argued that the normative components cannot be easily disentangled from the critical functions of genealogy. And of course, we can add to this the fact that the motivations for pursuing genealogies on the left-hand side of the equation uh, are always going to rely on the value commitments of the scholar who is pursuing them. And so to conclude with things a little up in the air, this inevitably, I think, complicates attempts to observe a neat division between normative and non-normative aspects of genealogies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your presentation. Now I um, can introduce our respondent to Peter's paper, um, who is Brad Gregory, Professor Brad Gregory, who is the Dorothy Griffin Collegiate Chair in European History at the University of Notre Dame. Um, his research interests center on Christianity in the Reformation era and the long-term consequences of this era in the making of the modern Western world. His book um, mentioned by Peter, The Unintended Reformation, published in 2011, offers one of the most um, intensely debated uh, genealogies of modernity, having received many reviews and discussions. Uh, so we're delighted to have Brad to continue the conversation started yesterday with Peter, over to you. Thanks very much. We, um, one of the pleasures of aging uh, as an academic is that whereas earlier in your career, you might've said something like, I've read and learned for, from so-and-so for years, there comes a point uh, when you have enough gray hair that you instead can start to say for decades. And uh, that's the case for myself with respect to Peter Harrison's uh, scholarship on the relationship of Christianity and natural philosophy in early modern Europe, especially early modern England, uh, in addition to much broader analyses, of course, 
such as the one he pursued in the territories of science and religion. And it's, I mean this genuinely, it's a privilege to offer a few comments and pose a few questions about his uh, incisive paper for our conference. Uh, Peter's paper operates, uh, I see it, on both conceptual and substantive levels, taking a differentiated approach to early modern science as an applied case study for the distinction he draws between logical and normative genealogical analyses, you know, even as he, at the end of his presentation, qualifies, saying that, well, we can make this distinction, but it's not so clear, and depending on what the object is and so forth, it might not be as neatly separable. Um, as we might think. His paper's principal concern is with the former type of genealogies, the logical, especially theological genealogies in which modernity, the modern era, modern science, or his particular concern, certain aspects of modern science are or are not argued to be dependent for their intelligibility, their coherence, or their functioning on original early modern theological matrices. As primary protagonists of different approaches, opposed views about the modern era as a whole, he adduces Lovett uh, on the same side in certain important respects with Schmidt, arguing for unintelligibility absent theological foundations, and on the other side, Blumenberg, arguing not only for the legitimacy, but also the intellectual autonomy of the modern site as a whole from whatever its theologically substantive historical precedents might have been. Peter helpfully suggests that rather than pronouncing wholesale on modernity, a more targeted piecemeal approach to aspects of modern science is more fruitful because more tractable and less fraught. Thus he considers in turn in the second half of his paper, the distinctly early modern notion of the laws of nature as dependent on a voluntarist conception of God imposing his will on inert matter to account for their rational intelligibility and invariability and the relationship between early modern Christian notions of religious experience and scientific experiment. Both the laws of nature and scientific experiment in secularized modern science claim to stand on their own and not to require reference to God respectively for their coherence or their reliability. Peter argues convincingly, I think, that the latter seems to come down on the Blumenbergian side and that with scientific ex experimentation, to use his phrase, we can just throw the latter away, but on the Lovitian side regarding the laws of nature. Now, before taking up some of these questions with respect to the substantive concerns of his paper, uh, Peter offers something of an excursus on normative genealogies in relationship to logical genealogies. And that was the first part of his presentation today as well. And although probably most people in the audience won't believe this, I, I really don't want to rehearse yet again arguments I've had with so many interlocutors in the nine years since the unintended reformation uh, was published. But since Peter brought it up, I can't but uh, let pass that I do not agree uh, with his implication that somehow I unwittingly or imprudently mixed unobjectionably logical analysis with reference to religious or moral commitments in such a manner that I open myself to justifiable accusations of being a Catholic apologist. I've maintained all along, no critic has shown otherwise, that nothing in the unintended reformation depends substantively on my faith commitments, nor would anything in the book's analysis change if, say, I converted to Islam or became an atheist. The historical analysis, that is Peter's level of logical genealogy, would remain exactly the same. So too, Catholicism and its place within our current pluralism are what they are, whether I happen to accept Catholic claims and practice the Catholic faith or not. The reaction by some critics, it seems to me, is not about my unwitting dependence on my normative commitments, but rather about the fact that my logical genealogical analysis has quite uncomfortable implications for their normative commitments. It's a subversive threat. Rather than an intrusion of the more controversially normative into the territory of the strictly logical, I would suggest a different paradigm or model to explain sociologically the response of some readers to my book, namely that of heresy to orthodoxy. The same goes for the reaction of some readers to Nagel's mind and cosmos. How could one of the world's most distinguished analytical philosophers dare to challenge neo-Darwinian evolutionary naturalism? How dare Gregory point out fundamental differences between Catholicism and Protestantism, 
How dare he critique secular liberalism? Here's the sociological inference to draw, that those with the temerity to challenge pointedly the cornerstone of worldviews and governing macro narratives about the bases for which the protagonist would really prefer not to have to think will be denounced as heretics to approve dogmas, which was incidentally exactly what I expected would happen, here quoting from the last pages, some of the last sentences of the unintended reformation, quote, subversive ideas and unsettling research that threaten seemingly settled foundational assumptions are just as likely to be welcomed now as they were in the late middle ages. That is not at all. It doesn't matter how unoriginal, banal or obvious the point is. For example, that sola scriptura led and leads to an open-ended range of rival interpretations of scripture's meaning and associated Protestant churches, whether in the 16th century or since, or that there are no justifiable grounds for human rights if human beings are nothing more than matter energy in motion, or even just the bare fact that Catholicism persists today and has numerous intellectually distinguished adherents. Unless, for example, McIntyre, Rist, Taylor, O'Regan, Brog, Sokolowski et al. don't count. Never mind the lack of any forthcoming counter arguments or counter evidence. All such views are unacceptable because uncomfortable, especially when they are combined in an ambitious, explanatorily powerful counter narrative. The only normative argument I make in the Unintended Reformation is at the very end of the conclusion, namely that if the academy were consistent with its own ostensible principles, it should unsecularize itself and welcome a rethinking of important questions and issues on which it has mistakenly and dogmatically foreclosed, not least regarding the spectacular incoherence of the affirmation of metaphysical naturalism itself. But heaven forbid academic freedom should actually be practiced and permit intellectually responsible theological inquiry. Let's all continue the charade of pretending that contingent being isn't contingent, that the law of gravity and quantum states as for example, Lawrence Krauss and Stephen Hawking absurdly claim are somehow close enough to ontological nothingness to count as nothingness and that we can dispense with a transcendent metaphysically necessary ground of all contingent being. Now on to the science. The first point I'd like to make pertains to the defense of Bacon and his many 17th century followers about the new sciences as in fact contributing to moral and religious formation. I have to admit it seems silly for me to pose a question like this to a scholar, namely Peter, who wrote such a brilliant book about the historically changing referent of what we call science and religion. But doesn't the content of the claims matter along with what sort of moral and religious formation is relatedly envisioned? especially in relationship to predecessor and or rival contemporary claims. Bacon's use of caritas as the countervailing tamer of vana curiositas, I think is a good example. Of course, he understood this in religious and not secular terms, but doesn't his argument constitute a crucial innovation and departure from the thrust of the dominant, albeit not entire, medieval Christian tradition that owed so much to Augustine on this point? I'm reminded here of the argument in Mark Valeri's excellent book, Heavily Merchandise, that New England ministers in the 1730s were couching their arguments for the pursuit of wealth in religious language, no less than had the first generation of New England's Puritan ministers in the 1630s employed religious language. True enough, their language and categories were not secular, but rather religious. They made reference to God, divine providence, etc. And yet their arguments were not just different from but antithetical to those of their Puritan forebears a century before. And as things turned out, Bacon's quote, relief of man's estate, unquote, had been much inflated already before the end of the 17th century. And regardless of what Bacon might have envisioned, it was inflated to Nicholas Barbone's infinite wants of the mind. As Barbone wrote in 1690, quote, man naturally aspires, his wants increase with his wishes, which is for everything that is rare, can gratify his senses, adorn his body, and promote the ease, pleasure, and pomp of life." Unquote. As Peter knows much better than I, the binary religious versus secular is a blunt instrument when we're talking about the intellectual history of the territories of science and Christianity from the 17th through the 19th centuries. A second issue. Without in any way doubting the importance of England to any adequate account of early modern European science, 
I wonder whether the relationship of the latter to Christianity is so heavily an English or so exclusively a Protestant story as seems implicit in this paper. Does the story change, and if so, how, for example, we focus not just so much on Bacon and his legacy through the Hartlib generation, the Royal Society in England, to Newton and Newtonianism beyond, but instead look, for example, at Leiden and experimental medicine in anatomy in the 17th century Dutch Republic. How are the laws of nature related to Galileo's application of mathematics to motion and the origins of modern mechanics, breaching that quantitative qualitative divide with respect to Aristotelian natural philosophy, which started even before Galileo left Pisa for Padua in 1591? Or indeed, to refer to a much earlier instance, with the Oxford calculators of the early 14th century, especially John Dumbleton, who were already quantifying Aristotelian natural qualities of motion. Such examples, at a minimum, show that Aristotelian qualitative natural philosophy was not unquestioned, inert, or intact when 17th century English Protestants came along with theological voluntarism and applied their understanding of God to inert matter and motion. And what about the fact that the key figure for the laws of nature understood in voluntaristic terms in Peter's paper is Descartes, like Galileo and the Oxford calculators, of course, a Catholic. So no reformation, no science as we know it with respect to the laws of nature, provided we include Descartes as the influential 17th century fountainhead of the concept. And finally, one last question, this one related to the relationship between early modern religious experience and natural philosophical experiment. I wonder whether a reason for the separability and eventual autonomy of the latter here coming down with Blumenberg in contrast to the rational intelligibility of the laws of nature is the heterogeneity, rivalry and individual subjectivity of early modern Christian religious experience in contrast and comparison to scientific experimentation as it developed from the 17th through the 19th centuries. Members of the Royal Society would have been none too keen to say the least of hearkening back and admitting into dialogue and discussion about matters of experimental natural philosophy, the religious experiences of, for example, Quakers, Muggletonians, ranters, and other radicals from the 1640s and 50s, any more than of contemporary enthusiasts during the restoration decades. I doubt too that advocates for analogous consideration of the experiential ecstasies of Teresa of Avila or other early modern Catholic mystics would have roused much more enthusiasm among members of the Royal Society, which is to say the boundaries of permissible religious experience in relationship to scientific experiment in late 17th or 18th century England were already at least implicitly in place and religious experience per se or taken as a whole was too diverse, chaotic and uncontrollable a domain to be able to contribute in any sustained stable way to the intersubjectivity, repeatability, and verifiability that became some of the hallmarks of scientific experimentation. Tremendously enjoyed the paper and the presentation, um, as well as the chance to connect virtually uh, with Peter, despite our being uh, geographically so distant and in such uh, radically discrepant time zones. Thanks. Thank you, Brad. Thank you for giving us uh, such a good demonstration of how historians debate amongst one another for a theologian like myself. Um, and I, I, I will bring in the panelists um, of today in a minute, but I wonder if Peter would like to um, respond to some of Brad's comments. Yeah, look, thanks, thanks, Pui, I, I think br briefly. I mean, first, thanks, Brad, for those comments and apologies for sending you such a, a big document. Uh, you've managed it incredibly well. Um, so. Uh, th thanks for that. Look, let me, I'll, I'll respond to three aspects of what you said. Look, I'm glad you were drawn on this question of your own normative commitments, because I do think that's part of what, part of what this meeting is exploring. And, and I, I'm very sympathetic to what, to what you say there, because I do think, I do think that the logical force is what, is what gets up people's noses, as it were. But I still, I still think that why you think why you think you're not bringing normative issues to the table and why a number of your critics think you are is because what counts as normativity is not clear. And, and insofar as you attack secular liberalism, 
that's regarded as the base standard of the kind of neutral premise on which we now operate. Of course. And so, and so it's what counts as neutrality is what's in play in the genealogy. And you can't, you will never, you won't win on that because, because as you, you, the neat distinction between the normative and the critical, I, I think that, that blurring. And why I say that is I encounter this with my own colleagues where I think I'm innocently presenting a historical argument They're saying, well, no, you're being normative, but I can't see it either. Um, so I, I think that's part of what's part of what's going on there. But certainly I think that that, that uh, uh, you get ad hominem attacks and, and that's that's what's really striking about the case of um, the, the, the case of Nagel, who clearly has no religious commitments whatsoever. Um, so if he can't get away with it, people like you are not either. What can you do? Yeah, well, exactly. uh, <laughs> uh, so, so look now uh, on ba on bacon. Look, I agree with I agree with pretty much everything you said there, and and uh, I think in the past I have been kind of defensive of Bacon in this sense because Bacon has sometimes been interpreted as a kind of Machiavellian figure who, who's Putative religious commitments are kind of veil for a re, for for his atheism. I think that's completely wrong, <clears throat> and in a sense, I've wanted to defend Bacon as, as kind of sincere in his religious commitments. But I think you're exactly right. He, he, when Bacon appropriates a, a fall narrative, he, he he changes the story, and when he appropriates charity, he changes it to a completely different conception of what counts as charity. And so the question there, I think, is not. It, whether this is some kind of traditional Christian justification or rather some kind of heretical deviation um, from, from what was a, a medieval tradition. So I, I'm, I'm pretty much in complete agreement with you um, on, on that, um, on that issue. Last point, the Protestant story um, and the focus on England two aspects to this, I think. Look, I, I do think England is important. Um, and the instances you gave were aspects of the science, components of what goes into natural science. Um, and, and why I think the England story is important because it's not, a, not just about the components that make up the new things that make up natural science. It's about how they get their social status and legitimacy. So it's the boom bust thing, right? And, and I do think those legitimation questions, for me at least, are, are, are much clearly, more clearly seen in the English situation. I also think that there is a half of the story that I've never really told. And that's partly to do with the rational empiricist distinction, which I see is emerging out of two competing kind of theological anthropologies. And, and Descartes re represents one of these kind of rational traditions where the natural light is preserved and a Protestant experimental tradition is much more to do with the fallen, what you do in a fallen world with fallen senses and so on. But I, I won't attempt to, to expand beyond that here. But look, I will say this partly in relation to some of your remarks last night, there's a kind of methodological question here too. And, and that's to do with, if you want to tell a big story how, how how do you get over that? How do you get over the all of the ground that you need to cover? And you and John Milbank, I think, do this incredibly well. You, you have a remarkable command of the secondary sources. Um, I have a slightly different approach, which is to is to try and work from very kind of narrow narrow case studies and then generalise. And I think there's always a danger in 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 my approach that that what will happen is that you can't actually do the generalization that you need to tell the big story. But as I, again, as I said last night, I think telling the big story is really a, a crucial part of what we need to do as historians and break out of those narrow disciplinary boundaries. But in my case, it's at the, the cost of running the risk of not being able to do the kinds of big generalizations that ideally I would like. So I, I take that on board as, a, as an issue. So. So thanks, Brad. I mean, I think they were they were good comments, um, and and I take them on board. Thank you, Peter. Um, I now wonder if any of my panelists would like to um, raise a point to either Brad or Peter. Jonathan Ragnar. Oh, Ragnar, yes, please. Did you want me to say something back? I think Ragnar is his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, bad. My bad. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you for that, Peter. It was very, very interesting. Um, I, I just want to pick up on one thing you, you write towards the end of your, uh, your paper. You, you sort of uh, put forward a, a word of, of caution about uh, periodizations and, and genealogies and, and sort of uh, over reliance on terms like the Middle Ages, the modernity, etc. Now, one of the things that genealogists can do, despite many of them actually relying on these categories, is that they can relativize them, as you have done so br brilliantly with religion and science. As one does that, however, what tends to happen is that an analytic term, like modernity, ends up being just endlessly described, right, and studied discursively, right? So what we do is we go, we move away from studying religion to studying how people speak about religion. And the same thing, same danger can happen with modernity, right? We go from discussing what is modernity, how did it happen, to, to discussing how people talk about modernity. So uh, one question I have is how do you as a historian after recognizing the pitfalls of assuming such an analytic term and after doing the genealogizing is there any way of recuperating the term at the end does it have a place as an analytic term when you're finished and done um, do you just go back to a very contextualist approach and say modernity in this context means this very specific thing would you get rid of the term altogether look that's just that's just a terrific it's a terrific question, and I, and I think it's a constant tension that you have to deal with. So I'm interested in science. Let's say I'm interested in science and religion. I'm interested in them because this is how we, we presently think about them. But insofar as then we historicise these terms and argue that, you know, argue for the historical relativity, what can then we, what then can we say about their, their status as analytic categories? And if... if you know what you find you do if you if you contextualize every single analytic term you've got no way of actually getting any purchase on you know having a rational discussion about them you can't tell any big story you know or you've got a you know or, or you've got a contingent detail so i feel you know i feel the force of your question i think it's an excellent question um what i console myself with is the fact that that if you start in if you start in the present, you've got to start with with the analytic categories that people are actually using, and and you work away at aspects of those that you think are problematic. Now, I think in the case of science, in a sense, it's a to to, to do the to, to do the historical genealogies of science, it's to some extent a lost cause because because of the social legitimacy of science. It's very hard to, to say, let's just give up talking about science and go back to talking about natural philosophy or natural history and so on. Um, in the case of religion, though, I do, I do think it's different because, because religious communities have a, have a stake in history because religious communities, typically in Christianity at least, want to, want to map onto something like you know, early Christianity or the New Testament or you know the, the 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 magisterium. All of these are historical categories, and I, and so I, I do think, in the case of a, a term like religion, you've actually got, and I'm a historian, but there's actually you've got some theological work that you can do there, and you see this in people like Bart, who who will talk about the you know, famously in Church Dogmatics. I want to say two one anyway, one of those, you know critiques the category of religion, religion as the abolition, sorry, revelation as the abolition of religion and so on. So look, I think it's a terrific question and, and the, we, we can't actually do our work with analytic categories. We can't get rid of them, but we've got to kind of strike that balance between a critical approach to them um, and, and, and endless uh, um, ramification, I think. Thank you, Peter. Um, before I turn to Jonathan, um, I'd like to encourage anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, now is a good time to uh, post it on the chat. We should have um, some time for addressing the questions. Now, Jonathan. Thank you, Peter, for your paper and the uh, presentation. Um, I just picked up, I kind of want to ask you um, some things that you said and you know, correct me if I misheard or anything, but you said something to the order of methodological criticisms are often smuggling in an alternative um, normative scheme. Um, and I guess I was just kind of wondering whether 
um, you thought that it was possible to have a methodological criticism without smuggling in that normative scheme. Um, and then like how you would tell the difference between those two or whether it just kind of becomes this like overwhelming criticism that you just kind of layer on top. Like there's a predetermined kind of matching between method and normativity there. Um, these are um, for the discipline of theology, this becomes a pretty significant point itself, particularly those who are always trying to push people out of talking about method because it's just throat clearing. It's not the real stuff yet. Or the people who, um, you know, kind of only want to stick there and say like, this is how we're going to resolve all of our problems. Anyway, so I'd be interested in just how you would parse that um, in that way. But thanks a lot for your paper. It's really kind of, uh, yeah, a joy to read and gave me a lot to think about. Right. Look, look, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for your question, which I, again I think is a, is a good one. And, and 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 Brad might have things to say about this too, because this is an issue that um, afflicts him probably more than more than me. Look, here's what here's what I would say. I can't actually speak for for theology because that, as I've said, theologians get a free pass in the space of normativity, but clearly in the sciences you've got a principle of methodological naturalism, right? And if if you start to mess around with that. Um, you're in big trouble, and and it's. A, I think the lines there are very clear, and I think that in in history, this is this was where it becomes really blurred. And I think that this is an accusation I've I've heard certainly levelled against Brad that his histories don't actually observe some kind of naturalistic principle. But you know, here's the thing: its naturalism is part of what is it? its commitment to naturalism is part of what's at stake in the whole discussion itself. Um, and, and as I've said, ditto, the, the version of this in, in the political sphere is liberalism, which is supposed to be putatively neutral. And again, historical work shows that it's not. So um, now, ha having said that, I mean, I do, I was interested in Brad's remarks last night. I, I'm not a great methodological thinker. I, I get out there and do the stuff. And, and if, if this conference has actually forced me to think much more explicitly about my method, and I'm not sorry about that but it's not something that keeps me up at night so i'm not overly bothered by these methodological questions but the specific instance of the example that you've used that strikes me as the intriguing one for us us is around this question of methodological not even methodological naturalism but well yes methodological naturalism and the relations between methodological naturalism and you know naturalism pure and simple which tends to be associated with methodological neutrality and and I, I, I think that's wrong but in the guild of historians it's it, as in as in the sciences too it's very difficult to 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 push back against that without being labeled some kind of you know nutcase or religious apologist and as I say in theology clearly that's not a problem because you're expected to have, I'm assuming you're expected to have normative commitments right unless you're an Anglican of course. No, I, I take that. I take that back. Um, so, not a very satisfactory answer to a question, but again, it's a, it's a, it's an excellent one for what, what we're talking about in this meeting. Anything to add, Brad? Oh, you're muted. Oh, do you want me to say something as well? Sure. If you, you... Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go on and on. This is Peter's session. Um, a couple of things. I mean, I, I agree with everything Peter was just saying. One is many of the people made distinctions, not my own by any means. The difference between right, methodological naturalism, absolutely a prerequisite for anybody who wants to do any kind of natural science. I don't think there's any question about that. That's uncontroversial as far as I can tell. But what we have to a very large extent is a seepage and de facto appropriation of a de facto dogmatic metaphysical naturalism, not only among scientists, which is completely unjustified, and indeed, I would say unintelligible if you press it far enough for the reasons I talked about before. Um, but also, I'm, I'm guessing uh, STEM dominates at everybody's university. Any 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 uh, any universities that we come from where you know art history and the literature departments are just crushing the, the engineers? Yeah, I didn't think so. We know we know the cultural societal right capitalistic weight of the sciences and the application of the sciences. They're the ones that call the shots. They get all the big funding, et cetera, et cetera. 
So there's no question, you know, that when somebody who's just a fool, and I mean, Steven Pinker, Peter wrote a very charitable uh, review of, of uh, his book, Enlightenment Now. I, I deliberately refrain from writing reviews of books like that because, you know, it would just confirm everybody's uh, suspicions about me. But in any case, um, you know, they, they say whatever they want to. It's not based on science at all. And dogmatic metaphysical naturalism, and all people have to do is read chapters two through four of David Hart's book, The Experience of God. And if you can't have, if you don't have a response to what he says there with absolute lucidity about the complete unintelligibility, the sheer nonsensical absurdity of thinking that somehow the contingency of contingent being could just be there, you haven't even grasped the problem. So it's not surprising that people like Stephen Hawking say, well, you know what? Gravity must have generated. What the hell are you talking about? You don't even see the problem. But this is what happens when physicists don't recognize the legitimacy of non-empirical, different kinds of questions that underlie everything that they, that, that, that they do, properly understood within the canons of methodological naturalism when they're operating as physicists. Anyway, I'm not going to say any more. I could go on and on, but that's enough. Uh, I actually um, quite like to throw out just using my voice as a chair the question here, because I think it's relevant. I'm sure both of you know Stephen Gokroger's um, uh, four volume um, genealogies of sorts uh, of uh, the scientific culture. The question for me I have here is um, to, to, to what extent it's you, you, you think um, to, to, to understand uh, those dogmatic or methodological assumptions, we, we need to, historians need to change the way we, we tend to define them or, or the context in which we talk about them because one of the interesting thing about Gold Project's book is he starts to try to shift our understanding of science into thinking about it as a culture, as a, as a kind of life form, as a kind of sets of practice and communities, uh, um, you know, things that we, we, we live by and, and we, we just, you know, do it. And, and how much do you think that's um, part of the consideration of uh, these methodological questions we've been talking about. I don't. Can, would you, you you'd like me to have a stab at that? Sure. Look, look. Uh, you know, I, I I know Stephen well, and um, we, we've had many conversations about this. Stephen is an Stephen is an atheist, and so there's a good example there of how you can get agreement on the on the um, on the kind of critical genealogy side and and different normative different normative commitments. But look, when Stephen talks about a scientific culture, what, what he's primarily interested, I think, is in the, these questions of, of the legitimation of science. And, and the, the, I think the fascinating aspect of Stephen's story is that, look, the key to modern science is not all these ingredients like experiment and mathematization and those things. You see these in scientific cultures, plural. Um, what's distinctive about the West is not the emergence of science, it's the consolidation of science, and it's the movement of science into the centre of the culture where it becomes the, the, the dominant epistemic model. So if we're looking for something of what we need to explain, what I think is fascinating about Gork Rogers' work, and I think he's exactly right about this, is what has to be explained is not the rise of science. We see that in all kinds of places. What we need to explain is the sets of values that set it on the path that make it, that move it to the centre of Western culture. And his answer initially is that these are theological values. And I think he's exactly right about that. Now, he focuses on natural theology as the justification. I have a, a, a number of other things besides. But I think that's that's a that's a, a, a key point, and and I think it's a really, particularly the first volume of, of the, the series is 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 an excellent one for, for us to think about. Thank you, Peter. Um, I will take one question from the floor uh, from Joanna Leidenhag. Um, thank you for such an engaging and lucid presentation and discussion. Uh, Brad noted that in Peter's longer paper the example of religious experience and scientific experiment falls more on the side of Blumenberg. Theologians tend to want to include everything they can within the logical critics of modernity. So can Peter say more about this alternative example? Um, hello, jo Joanna, thank, thanks, thanks for your question. Look, it, 
really, I won't go into the, the details of this particular example, but I suppose it goes to the, to the broad question that, that Blumenberg essentially accepts the conditions of the discussion from Lervet, that it's a question about the legitimacy of modernity, and they disagree about that. And my point here is that perhaps we should not be thinking about the legitimacy of modernity as an integrated whole, but whether in terms of what I've called this, this, these con, the aspects of consistency, whether some aspects of modernity might, might be entirely consistent, um, self-consistent and experiment, I think experimental method is one of those, but other aspects of it might in fact be dependent on these, these hidden variables. Now, wh why I think this is relevant, and, and again, I think this is significant for, for, for Brad's analysis last night, um, and, and, and I think the story of the unintended reformation is, whether all the bits and pieces have to go together as a package and, and, or whether you can do the mix and match. So, and I think this is what, this is what I think distresses uh, champions of modern liberal capitalist democracies. They might say, well, look, you know, sure, capitalism's not a great thing, but liberalism, come on, you know, human rights, all of that stuff. So do, do you have to be critical of the whole package or are there bits and pieces so that the genealogy that, that wants to dispense with modernity has to tell a story about how all these integrated pieces are interdependent in such a way that, and this is what gives us a decline narrative then, that the decline narrative wants to say, look, the whole thing is headed in the wrong direction. Um, and I don't know the answer to this question, but it seems to me that that argument requires that all of these integrated pieces can't actually be dismantled in such a way that there are, are bits that might be worth preserving or able to be consistently preserved in terms of the logic of the overall genealogical argument. So that's a general principle.